Based on this story, I conclude that Muhammad was a moron. If you're tired of the devil stealing, if you're tired of the devil killing, if you're tired of the devil destroying your life, you must order the personal pack package and you got to order it right now. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Defense Podcast today we are back with our favorite lying psychopath David Wood uh, let's see how many times he lies this time Muslim apologists are so desperate to defend their prophet that they don't mind calling him a lying moron if they think it will help their case take our all-time favorite Muslim apologist Menj if you don't know why I'm responding to Minge, you don't know the history of apologetics. Back in 2004 and 2005, when I was studying Islam and I started writing articles for the website Answering Islam, Minge was one of the main Muslim apologists that Christian apologists were responding to. There are dozens of articles on the site responding to Minge and his team. So when I heard that Minge was coming out of retirement to take down the Dizzle, I just had to see what he had to say about my relentless attacks on his fake prophet. So, as we can clearly see in this video, he is responding to a small YouTuber named Mensch. Now, I'm not personally familiar with the brother's work. However, what I find absolutely disgusting is that brother Amy and J, sorry, his name is not Mensch, it's Amy and J, uh, is a very small YouTuber. Uh, however, David has no shame in insulting him and sending his troll army to his YouTube channel. I saw that on his channel, his trolls are insulting him, bullying him, uh, insulting how he looks, how he speaks, etc. These people are truly disgusting. So if you're subscribed to me, definitely go and subscribe to Brother MANJ's channel. He is very brave to speak out against uh, David Wood and his, and his kind, even though his channel is very small. <laughs> So show me some love and support. Uh, now let's get back to the uh, psychopath. Let's check out one of Menge's refutations. Another uh, polemic that uh, David Wood is fond of making is uh, regarding the hadith where the uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he realized that he was nearing his death, he told Aisha that the pain that he was feeling at the time was as if something is cutting his aorta. So, according to Minge, Muhammad said that he felt as if his aorta was being severed. This is false. Muhammad simply said that he could feel his aorta being severed. Minge is clearly thinking of the English translation of Sahih al-Bukhari 4428. Notice the chapter heading, The Sickness of the Prophet and His Death. This is about Muhammad's sickness and death. Narrated Aisha. The prophet, in his ailment in which he died, used to say, Oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaibar, and at this time I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. The problem with this translation is that the words as if are not in the Arabic. They've been added by the translators. What Muhammad actually says is, I feel my aorta being cut from that poison. So, Muhammad ate some food at Kaibar. That food caused him pain because it was poisoned. And according to Muhammad, the poison eventually killed him. We'll read more from Muhammad in a moment, but why is Muhammad's claim about his aorta being severed relevant? Back to you, Menj. I don't really understand David's point here, but even if you take out the word as if in there, it still doesn't change anything. Here, David is committing the ambiguity fallacy. Even if the prophet said, I feel my aorta, aorta is being cut, doesn't mean he is feeling his aorta being literally cut. It could simply be a metaphor. For example, I could say, I feel sick watching David Wood's videos. Does that now mean that I literally feel sick after watching his videos? No, David, it's a metaphor. It's, it's a way for me to express that I don't like your videos. That doesn't mean I actually feel sick after watching them. 
Same with the Prophet. He could simply be using a metaphor to express that he is not feeling well. He feels his aorta being cut, meaning he is feeling sick. Not that his aorta is literally being cut. Also, no one would survive and be able to speak if their aorta is literally being cut. Only a idiot like David would believe that. So, this is an obvious metaphor. He is simply expressing that he is not feeling well or dying because of the poison or because of the fever. Not that his aorta is literally being cut. As a matter of fact, we have clear cut evidence that shows that the sentence aorta being cut was a popular saying or a metaphor in the Arabic literature to express death in any form. For example, Arabic linguist expert uh, and Quranic exegete Imam al Zamakshari says in his book Asas al Balaga, pages 121 to 122, that the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, could be used metaphorically to explain someone dying. Let me put this argument in a logical form. Premise 1. According to David, uh, the psychopath's theory, the Prophet said it, he literally feels his aorta being cut in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, 4428. Premise 2. If we find any evidence or valid alternatives that contradicts this theory, it would be proven false. Premise 3. We know that Imam al Zamakshari's commentary that the aorta being cut is a metaphor. And we also know that it's impossible for someone to speak who had their aorta cut, literally. So it has to be a metaphor, which contradicts David's theory. Conclusion. Therefore, David's theory about the Prophet saying his aorta was literally cut is proven false. Now let's continue. Interestingly, the Quran says that if Muhammad were to fabricate revelations, Allah would punish him by severing his aorta. Surah 69, verses 44 through 46. And if he, Muhammad, had forged a false saying concerning us, Allah, we surely would have seized him by his right hand, or with power and might, and then we certainly would have cut off his life artery. And in parentheses, the translators add, Aorta. So, Allah told us how Muhammad would die if he were to forge or fabricate revelations, and it's exactly how Muhammad died. This is a lie. The psychopath just can't help himself. Here, if you notice carefully, you will see that the verse is obviously talking about aorta literally. Allah SWT is responding to people who think that the Prophet might be making up some verses. He says, if he did that, his aorta would have been cut, which means instant death. So this is not a metaphor. This is also confirmed by classical commentators such as Ibn Kathir who said, and then we certainly would have cut off Al-Watin from him. Ibn Abbas said that Al-Watin refers to the artery of the heart, and it is the vein that is attached to the heart. This has also been said by uh, Ikrima Said bin Jubair, Al-Hakim Katada, Ad-Dadak, Ad-Dahak, uh, Muslim Al-Batin, and Abu Shakr. Uh, Humayad bin Ziyad, Muhammad bin Kab said that it al-Watin is the heart, its blood, and whatever is near it. You read about this in the, in the Tafsir of Al-Kathir, Ibn Kathir. So David should have no problem accepting this since he himself said, Islam's greatest commentator of all time, Ibn Kathir, Islam's greatest commentator of all time, Ibn Kathir, Islam's greatest commentator of all time, Ibn Kathir. As you can see, he didn't interpret this verse as a metaphor or anything. What's more is that the verse speci specifically talks about artery of the heart. Which means, if this is something that were to happen, the Prophet would have felt pain in his heart. However, nowhere in the hadith do we see that he felt pain in his heart. As a matter of fact, there is a great article on Sunnah Online where they dealt with references, uh, where they deal with uh, the incidents or the last few days of uh, before the death of the Prophet. What happened, how, what he went through, etc. And here they say that the Prophet had a fever and a headache. They said, and I quote, On Monday the 29th of Safar, in the 11th year of Hijrah, he participated in the funeral rites in Al-Baqi. Al On the way, he had a headache. His temperature rose so high that the heat effect could be felt over his headband. He led the Muslims in prayer for 11 days, though he was sick. The total number of his sick days were either 13 or 14. You can read about this in sunnahonline.com, the article about the death of the Messenger of Allah. So as you can see, the Prophet died from a fever or a headache. Nowhere does it say he felt any type of pain in his heart. As a matter of fact, if you 
search the word heart, it's not even mentioned in the whole article. So no, David, the prophet did not die the same way as in the Quran describes. You're committing the faulty comparison fallacy where you're com trying to compare two different things that has nothing to do with, do with each other. Let me put this argument in a logical form. Premise 1. According to David's theory, the Prophet died exactly the same way as mentioned in verse 6946. Premise 2. If we find any evidence that contradicts this theory, it would be proven false. Uh, premise 3. We learn from Ibn Kathir and Ibn Abbas that the word Al-Watin refers to veins of the heart. Other scholars also confirm this by saying that it is talking about the heart. Yet when we look at the Hadith or the Prophet's death, nor do we see he felt pain in his heart or anything like that. Instead, it says he felt a headache or a fever, which contradicts David's theory. Conclusion. Therefore, David's theory about the Prophet dying the same way as mentioned in the verse uh, chapter 69, 46 is proven false. So as you can see, David the Psycho has once again proved himself to be a giant, lying, disgusting, fat piece of filth, filthy moron once again. Good job, David. Now let's continue. What do you think, Minge? This is a fallacy of equivocation. The word aorta in the hadith is not the same as the word used in the Quran for aorta in the Arabic language. That's not equivocation, Minj. It's kind of the reverse of equivocation. Here's a quick lesson. Equivocation is using the same word, the same word, in an argument, but changing the meaning of the word. So, you're using the same word with two different meanings, not using two different words that have the same meaning. Are we using the word aorta, but with two different meanings? Not at all. We're using two words that refer to the same thing. Even in English, you can call it the aorta, or you can call it the life artery. Arabic has more than one word for the aorta. But the word in the Quran refers to the aorta, and the word in the Hadith refers to the aorta. So, is this equivocation? Are we using one word with two meanings? No, we're using two words that have the same meaning. This is a lie. <laughs> yes, David, you are using one word with different meaning. As a matter of fact, you are using, your use of equivocation is so bad that you managed to do it in two different languages. <laughs> That's right, you committed the equivocation fallacy not just in English language, but also in Arabic language. You tried to make it seem like that the word aorta in the Hadith and the word aorta in the Quran is the same thing. However, this is not the case. The word aorta in the Hadith is being used in a metaphoric sense, and the word aorta in the Quran is being used in a literal sense. So they are not the same things, are they? Now, this is how you committed the equivocation fallacy in English. However, you also did the same thing in Arabic as well. You said this is two different words that mean the same thing. That's not the case. The word used in Quran is al-watin, which specifically refers to the heart or the artery of the heart. However, the Arabic word used in the hadith is al-abhar. Here, check this out. Al-watin. Al-watin. Al-Watin Al-Hari al Now if you notice the word uh Al-Watin is not mentioned here. It says Al-Abhar. So as you can see, the word used here is Abhar, Abhari or Abhar. According to Az uh, Zubaydi, in his famous Arabic dictionary, he quotes a scholar named Ibn Athir who said, uh, the, Ab the Abhar is a vein that originates from the head and extends to the feet. So as we can clearly see, the two different words do not mean the same thing. They mean two completely separate things. The al-abhar refers to the vein that goes from head to the feet. However, al-watin refers uh, specifically to the heart or veins of the heart. They are not the same thing. David the Psycho uses the word aorta in the hadith to mean the same thing as in the Quran, even though the Arabic word means two different things in two different places. The hadith refers to the uh, vein from head to feet. 
However, the Quran refers to the veins in the heart. They're not the same thing. This is how the David the Psycho commits the equivocation fallacy. And by the way, this is something you have to always be careful of. Uh, people who have studied philosophy or logic will always try to make it seem like, you know, uh, you're wrong when you call out a fallacy. But you have to see underneath that and realize that whenever they try to do that, in not always, but in many cases, they're actually wrong. Uh, especially, uh, uh, especially people like David Wood who like try to move your move the original accusation away from him. Now you might say that well, this is not his fault, right? I mean, it's a mistranslation. I would agree. However, David, being the moron that he is, just couldn't keep his mouth shut, and he had to say this. So, according to Minch, Muhammad said that he felt as if his aorta was being severed. This is false. Muhammad simply said that he could feel his aorta being severed. Minj is clearly thinking of the English translation of Sahih al-Bukhari 4428, narrated Aisha. The prophet in his ailment in which he died used to say, Oh Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaibar, and at this time I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. The problem with this translation is that the words as if are not in the Arabic. They've been added by the translators. The words as if are not in the Arabic. The words as if are not in the Arabic. This clear cut exposed the fact that he lied. He knows full well what the Arabic says, and he knows the word, the two words mean two different things in, in the Quran and in the Hadith, in the Arabic. He has been in the apologetic game long enough to know this, and yet he chose to lie to you and say that two different words mean the same thing in English? And here we get to the hilarious part. The Battle of Kaibar was fought in either 628 or 629. Muhammad died in 632. So Muhammad died a few years after the Battle of Kaibar. But Muhammad was poisoned by a Jewish woman around the time of the Battle of Kaibar. Muhammad and his followers had killed the woman's father, uncle, and husband. Based on this story, I conclude that Muhammad was a moron because only a moron would accept a dinner invitation from a woman whose entire family was just slaughtered by the moron's followers. This is a lie. The Jewish woman named Zainab bint al-Harith uh, was not some innocent, uh, uh, you know, angel. <laughs> Her husband, Salam, commanded the resistance from the Natat area in Kaibar. He was killed in battle on the first day and Zainab's brother al-Harith took over the defense of Kaibar. You can read about this in M.H. Heckel's uh, Life of Muhammad, uh, page number 404. Nine days later, Ali managed to penetrate the fortress of Naim. Zainab's father challenged the Muslims to single combat and killed several of them before Ali killed al-Harith. Uh, Mehrab ibn al-Harith then stepped forward to avenge his brother, but after a bloody battle, Ali also killed him. An alternative version states that Muhammad ibn Maslama was the one who killed Mahrab, but it could, be, it go, it, it could go either way. Now, Mahara's brother, Yasir, then ran out to avenge him, and Zubar ibn al-Awam killed him. After this, a general battle broke out, the Jews were defeated, when the Muslims killed Zainab's brother, al-Harith. So, as we can clearly see, the Prophet had literally nothing to do with the killing of her brother and her husband. They were killed by Ali radha al and others in battle. They were fighting in a war against the Muslims. Also, the whole Battle of Kaibar happened because the Jewish tribes were using Kaibar as a fortress and they were launching attacks against Muslims, or at least planning to, according to Dr. Shaki Abu Khalil, who says, The Jews of Kaibar contacted the people of, uh, of the Gaftan tribe, who were also known to be mercenaries for hire. As a reward for fighting the Muslims, the Jews of Kaibar offered them a percentage of their yearly harvest. Now get this, they, they were offering them money. Which, cons which consisted mainly of fruits and dates. So basically they were bribing them and paying them to fight against the Muslims. They furthermore established alliances with tribes of Fadak, Taima and Wadi al-Qura. Together they launched, uh, they were going to launch a surprise attack in, on al Madina. Having been informed of this plan, and this is one thing you have to note, the Prophet ﷺ had spies in their uh, in various different castles. So if their attack was coming, he would have known. Uh, having been informed of their plans, the Muslims who witnessed al Hudaybiyah traveled to Kaibar in, in order to bring an end to the plotting of its inhabitants and their allies. You read about this in Atlas of the Quran, 
places, nations, landmarks by Dr. Shaki Ab Khalil. Abu Khalil. Uh, you can read about this in the pages 307 to 308. So as you can see, they were planning an attack on the Muslims. The attack on Khaybar was a legitimate preemptive strike against the people of Khaybar who were on the enemy side and who was going to attack the Muslims. So no, David, the Jewish lady was completely in the wrong in trying to kill the Prophet. Her family was involved in the enemy side that was trying to attack the Muslims. They died killing many Muslims in the war. Now, even after all that, the Prophet chose to accept her invitation because he was a good person and he wanted to make peace and not war or violence. He believed in making peace, not violence. Even after all of that, the Jewish woman decided to poison the Prophet. So, no, David, he's not being a moron, but he's, he's being kind. However, even after that, the Prophet, even after the Jewish woman tried to poison the Prophet, he still forgave her because he, he understood her situation. He still forgave her for trying to kill him. There's a hadith which reads, Anas ibn Malik reported, a Jewish woman came to the messenger of Allah, peace and peace be upon him, who poisoned a sheep and he ate from it. She was brought to him and he asked her about it. She said, I wanted to kill you. The Prophet said, Allah has given you no authority over me. It was said that should we kill her? The Prophet said, no. I continue to see the effects of the poison upon the messenger of Allah. You can read about this in Sahih al-Bukhari, 2474. So, as you can see, the Prophet chose mercy and forgiveness over vengeance. Now, the woman was killed later on. However, that was done by the family members of the, uh, of the Prophet's companion, Bishir, who was also killed by the poison. And that was their right based on blood vengeance for killing their relatives. However, the point is the Prophet still chose to forgive her for trying to kill him. What's interesting is that Jesus did something very similar. He also forgave the people who tried to kill him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. You can read about this in Luke uh, chapter 23 verse number 34. Now, to be fair, this sentence father forgives them do not actually exist in the early manuscripts however let's be charitable and say that jesus did say this now if you're a christian i want you to look at the absolute hypocrisy here when the roman soldiers came uh, came this is what jesus did uh, you can read about this in matthew 26 chapter number 26 verse number 47 to 54 it says while he was speaking judas one of the twelve uh, arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man arrest him. So basically Judas uh, betrayed Jesus and he went to the, uh, he allied with the Romans to capture Jesus and he told uh, told the, the Romans or the Jews that in the crowd, the, the guy that I kiss is, uh, is Jesus. So, uh, you know, capture him. So, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, greetings Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came here for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With, with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? You can read about this in Matthew chapter 26 verse number 47 to 54. Now any sane person would use this opportunity and run away, but not Jesus. He decided to stay and trust the judgment of his enemies. Tell me David, how is this not stupid? All he had to do is use the opportunity and run away. Instead he decided to go with his enemies and trust their judgment. So. When Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decides to trust his enemy, he is a moron. But when Jesus does it, all of a sudden he is being merciful and kind? When the Prophet forgives his enemies, like the Jewish woman who killed him, he is a moron. But when Jesus forgives his enemies who killed him, he is a symbol of mercy and forgiveness? If you are a Christian, ask yourself, 
How is this not hypocritical? Now, if Jesus is being kind and forgiving, then so is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or none of them are. You guys mock Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for doing the same thing that Jesus did. Now, let me put this argument in a logical form. Premise 1. According to David Wood's theory, anyone who trusts his enemies is a moron. Premise 2. According to Matthew chapter 26, verse 47-54, to 54, Jesus, Jesus trusted his enemies instead of running away or fighting. Conclusion. Therefore, according to David's own logic, Jesus is a moron. Tell me, David, why are you calling your own God a moron? Us Muslims would never do this. We would simply say Jesus believed in making peace, which is why he trusted his enemies and forgave them when they tried to kill him. The Prophet Muhammad did the exact same thing. They were both great men. This is our belief. If you are a Christian, ask yourself, which is the better teaching? Christianity, which teaches you to hate Islam or Islam, or Islam, which teaches you that both Jesus and Prophet Muhammad were great men who believed the best nature of humanity to the point that they even forgave their enemies who tried to kill them or plot against them. With that, I'm done with the psychopath. Inshallah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.